Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here and uh, have the opportunity to, to give the clinical talk for this session. So these are my disclosures and they're in your syllabus. So um, the greatest um, physician of the 20th century, the many consider to be the father of internal medicine, said, when I see a blank patient walk in the front door, my tendency is to walk out the back door. What was he talking about, scleroderma? Some of the older physicians in the audience have this feeling when it comes to a, a scleroderma patient. He actually said that about a rheumatoid patient. So obviously in the 100 years since Osler said this, we've made great, great strides and we actually relish the idea of diagnosing and treating rheumatoid arthritis. We're not there yet for the connective tissue diseases, especially scleroderma, but I think um, during your, uh, the fellows who are going out into practice during their uh, next phase of their career, I think uh, we'll make great progress. So Osler was a uh, very well-educated uh, man, uh, studied the classics, could read Greek and Latin, and this is what he did say about uh, scleroderma. So he was uh, familiar with um, uh, Tennyson's poem on Tithonus, the Greek um, mythological figure who asked for eternal life but forgot to ask for eternal health. And um, so this poem had been uh, written several years uh, before um, Osler said this, but he, he wrote this in the context of scleroderma. In its more ag aggravated forms, diffuse scleroderma is one of the most terrible of human ills. Like Tithonus, to wither slowly and like him to be beaten down and marred and wasted until one is literally a mummy, encased in an ever-shrinking, slowly contracting skin of steel is a fate not pictured in any tragedy, ancient or modern. Uh, so Osler clearly had a way of saying things. So one of the other uh, profound things that he did write about scleroderma was that patients are apt to, to succumb to pulmonary complaints or to nephritis, and by nephritis he meant renal failure, not uh, inflammatory glomerulonephritis. Uh, it's interesting, if you read the uh, footnote there, this comes from a paper that he wrote on scleroderma and uh, with special reference to the diagnosis and to the use of thyroid extract in its treatment. So uh, obviously we've come a little bit further than Osler's days in terms of treating this disease. So uh, the purpose today is to introduce you to the new classification criteria, review the three main facets of this disease, and then finally, um, which I hope will be of interest to those of you who are not rheumatologists, through the words and the art of a patient, illustrate the major clinical features of, of scleroderma. I think if you're like me, you remember things better in the con when you learn them in the context of an individual patient. So I'll present a, a special patient here. And I'm gonna go through some of this very quickly. It's sort of an overview of the disease uh, and particularly the, um, the pathogenesis of it. But just so that we're all uh, starting on the same page, um, we use in clinical trials and research uh, something known as the modified Rodnan skin score. You won't use this in your practice unless you're doing a clinical trial. But the Rodnan skin score involves uh, dividing the body into 17 different parts. And each part is graded, z the skin tightness is graded zero, which is normal, to three, which is completely hide bound, with one and two being somewhere in between. So you can get a maximum of uh, score f of 51. Um, but again, that's um, not as important in practice, but it is important to classify patients uh, based on the extent of their skin disease. So as you can see, patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis have involvement of their skin proximal to the elbows and the knees, and particularly involving the trunk. Now, they also have distal or acral involvement as well. That's diffuse disease. Uh, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, what sometimes was referred to in the past as the Crest syndrome, or, and I'm old enough to remember when it was the CRST syndrome. Uh, those patients have much more limited involvement of their skin. 
so no involvement proximal to the elbows or the knees, and the trunk is spared. So it's confined to the distal extremities and the face. That's limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. So back in the old days, these were the uh, criteria, and they were, they were called the preliminary criteria for the classification of systemic sclerosis. And uh, they were formulated in 1980, and you could fulfill this criteria with one major criterion or two minor criterions. So uh, the major one was proximal skin thickening, or you could have two minor, sclerodactyly, as shown on the left, those digital pitted scars, or bibasilar pulmonary fibrosis. The problem with these criteria was that they lacked sensitivity, particularly for the milder forms of the disease. Uh, and they didn't, because of when they were developed in the 19, early eight, night, late 70s, early 80s, they didn't take into account some of the vascular features we now appreciate, as well as some of the autoimmune serological features that we now know. And among those vascular features are the uh, microvascular changes that can be observed at the nail fold capillary bed. And I, um, I show here a picture of Dr. Hildegard Marie, who was on our faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina for many years. She spent her entire career studying Raynaud's phenomenon and microvascular changes in scleroderma. And the panel on the left shows normal capillaries. A uh, panel in the middle has dilated capillary loops. You really don't need, need any magnification. What you would see on physical exam would be periungual erythema. But you can see that erythema would be due to those enlarged capillary loops. And the panel on the right is a much more uh, sinister looking uh, picture with loss of capillaries, obliteration of many capillaries, as well as some capillary dilation and some hemorrhage into the cuticle. So the, uh, the middle panel, she referred to as a slow pattern. That's what's often seen in patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. The active pattern on your far right is what's seen in patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Uh, you don't need a low power microscope. I think in the office you can use a dermatoscope is the best way to do this. Um, and it, this is very useful, particularly in the patient who comes in with Raynaud's phenomenon. So, uh, and you're trying to determine, is this primary Raynaud's phenomenon, which is going to be a nuisance for this woman uh, when her hands get cold, or is this the harbinger of something worse? And if the capillaries are abnormal, then it's more likely to be a secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, uh, most likely systemic sclerosis. In fact, the two um, strongest determinants of whether a patient is going to have uh, systemic sclerosis when they present with Raynaud's phenomenon would be nail fold capillary changes as shown here and a positive ANA, particularly a scleroderma specific uh, antinuclear antibody. So it's a very useful uh, and non-invasive test. So it, this is my first bullet point that points out that scleroderma systemic sclerosis is a vascular disease. The other problem with those original criteria is they didn't take into account the presence or the importance of the antinuclear antibody. And as you know, 95% uh, of scleroderma patients will have a positive ANA. And the point I make to our residents and our fellows is that when you're looking at a patient who has taut skin and the ANA <clears throat> is negative, that is a red flag. That may not be scleroderma. That may be one of the mimickers of scleroderma or pseudoscleroderma like nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, eosinophilic fasciitis, scleroderma, scleromyxedema, and some of these other rare uh, conditions that can present with tight skin but have a negative ANA. Same is true, these other uh, forms of pseudoscleroderma are usually not associated with Raynaud's phenomenon, nor are they associated with uh, abnormalities of the nail fold capillary bed. So those uh, two factors, absence of Raynaud's phenomenon, negative ANA, should make you scratch your head and think maybe this isn't scleroderma, maybe it's eosinophilic fasciitis or scleroderma or one of these other conditions. <clears throat> 
So the second bullet point is that scleroderma is an autoimmune disease. And I, this slide uh, is a build slide, so we'll go through it. And it was uh, given to me by um, one of my colleagues at MUSC, Dr. Carol Fagali Bostwick. So we know there are at least nine scleroderma-associated autoantibodies. And um, they generally are associated with either limited or diffuse disease. There are exceptions, but as you can see, uh, patients with diffuse scleroderma often have the topoisomerase or SCL70 autoantibody or the RNA polymerase 3 autoantibody, whereas patients with limited uh, forms of the disease more frequently will have the anti-centromere antibodies. So these are useful to categorize patients, but more importantly, they have some prognostic value. So for example, patients with anti-centromere antibodies with limited disease are at high risk for developing pulmonary arterial hypertension. You're gonna to wanna to watch those patients more carefully or closely for the potential development of pulmonary arterial hypertension. On the other hand, patients with diffuse disease who are RNA polymerase three positive are at the highest risk for developing scleroderma renal crisis. And I would add that recent uh, literature suggests that these patients are at high risk of having a perineoplastic process. So maybe those patients, in addition to monitoring their blood pressure very closely, it might be warranted to, uh, to evaluate them for potential uh, occult malignancy. The other autoantibodies uh, are associated with different manifestations of the disease, uh, particularly the topoisomerase or scleroderma 70 antibody tends to be associated with diffuse disease and interstitial lung disease. So these can be very useful uh, in not only categorizing patients for clinical trials, but also uh, in terms of prognosis. So these are the new uh, classification criteria. And again, if, if you uh, have a total score of nine, you fulfill the classification criteria for systemic sclerosis. With the, and, and that you get nine points for skin thickening of the fingers um, extending beyond the MCP joints. Now, with the caveat that you've excluded those mimickers like eosinophilic fasciitis and scleroderma, et cetera. So uh, you get points for puffy fingers or sclerodactyly, digital uh, ulcers or uh, digital pitted scars, telangiectasias, abnormal nail fold capillaries, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that these new criteria include su more subtle vascular features as well as the autoimmune features that were not included in the original criteria. And so uh, you can get to a value of nine and fulfill the classification criteria without necessarily having skin thickening proximal to the uh, MCP joints. So these are more sensitive and more, have a higher specificity than the original criteria. So here we're talking about sensitivity and specificity of say 91, 92% compared to the old criteria of about 70 to 75%. So scleros, scleroderma comes from the Greek, scleros meaning hard, derma meaning skin. And I give, um, pay homage to my predecessor at the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Leroy, who was the first to actually culture skin fibroblasts and demonstrate that those cells are producing excessive amounts of collagen. The collagen is qualitatively normal, but quantitatively in excess. Um, and um, this paper that he wrote in the early 70s is a seminal paper uh, and for the last 40 years, we've been trying to figure out why those cells are making excessive amounts of collagen. And we've made a lot of progress in terms of defining cytokines and growth factors that can, such as TGF-beta and CTGF and platelet-derived growth factor that can drive the a normal fibroblast to become abnormal and produce excessive amounts of collagen. And I think that sort of research will ultimately uh, lead to the development of more effective and more targeted drugs for the fibrotic aspects of the disease. 
And so this is my third bullet point. Scleroderma is a fibrosing disease. So like all of our rheumatic diseases, uh, we believe that there is a genetic predisposition. A lot of work is being done on the genetic susceptibility for scleroderma. But something in the environment has to trigger a, an immune inflammatory response. In the case of scleroderma, the target appears to be the endothelial cells. And the downstream effect of that autoimmune endothelial cell damage is fibrosis. All right, so let's go to a case study. And um, HIPAA privacy rule protects individual uh, identifi identifiable health information about a decedent for 50 years following the date of death. So I'm going to tell you about someone who died in 1940, so uh, the HIPAA rules do not apply here. And the patient is arguably the most famous scleroderma patient to have lived. Uh, he was Paul Clay. He was born in 1879 in Switzerland in a little town near Bern. His father was German and his mother was Swiss. This, this will be important for a later part of his life. And he grew up in this small little town. Uh, both of his parents were musicians. His father taught music. His mother gave music lessons. And they envisioned that their son Paul would one day follow in their footsteps. But um, one of his grandmothers gave him a set of chalk pencils, and um, he began to draw. And this is the earliest work, recorded work, of Paul Clay, uh, which he did when he was 10 years of age. And he um, was a good musician. He played in the Bern uh, Symphony as a uh, teenager, but, but art was really what he wanted to do. And the center of avant-garde art was not Paris at the time, but was Munich. And so at the age of 20, uh, he moved to Munich to take serious art lessons. Uh, and uh, here he is uh, on your far right playing the violin, I believe. I don't know if that's a viola. I think it's a violin. Anyway, this is a uh, quintet. And uh, he really enjoyed the bohemian lifestyle of Munich. And it was there that, in addition to taking art lessons, he came in contact with a lot of young artists who had a tremendous impression on him, um, including, most importantly, Vasily Kandinsky. So this picture on your left uh, is one of my favorites. It's from um, early in his career, 1903. And it's entitled, Two Men Meet Each Other Believing the Other to Be of Higher Rank. And you see they're not wearing any clothing or having any regalia or emblems to indicate their rank. So each one is trying to bow and scrape lower than the other. And this is a very fine drawing. You'll see how over the years his art changes uh, as he matures. Um, and while in Munich, in addition to meeting Kandinsky, he met another group of uh, young artists who were German, and some of them were Russian. And uh, he was invited to join the group, the, what was known as the Blue Rider or the Blau Reader group, uh, started by Kandinsky and Franz Marc and uh, August Mackey and, and others. And um, these were um, expressionist artists who were trying to break away from, from the art of the time in Germany. Well, I mentioned to you that um, Clay's father was German. And while living in Munich as a young man, when World War I broke out, um, towards the end of the war, uh, Clay was conscripted into the German army because the Germans used patrilineal descent. So even though he was born in Switzerland, he was considered by the uh, Imperial Army to be German. So he was conscripted into the Imperial Army. Um, fortunately, he did not serve at the front. Two of his artists and very close friends, August Mackey and Franz Marc, uh, were killed at the front. Uh, and this had a tremendous impact on him. Um, ironically, one of the jobs that Clay had during his time in the Imperial Army was to 
repair the camouflage on the German planes. Um, but this had a major influence on him, and the, the drawing on the right is entitled Death for the Idea, and uh, there's a body there in the foreground, and uh, there were many other uh, works of art that he did at this time that reflected his, uh, the effects of the war on him. So between the two wars was probably the happiest time of his life. Uh, here you see him on the left in his studio. Uh, he was invited to join the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was not a traditional art um, school. It blended uh, fine art with applied art and with um, uh, architecture to try and blend all of these things in a, in a modern world. Um, and it was there that he taught, he wrote a small but very important book on the theory of art. Uh, but after a while, in that particular state of Germany, the National Socialists or the Nazi Party took control and the Bauhaus had to move, the school was closed, they moved from Weimar to Dessau, and then about a year or two later after that, um, same thing happened in Dessau, and by then, Clay had uh, left to go to Dusseldorf to uh, work at the art museum there. But these were the very happy years of his life. So the first indication we have, and I must say uh, at this point that another disclosure is that we don't have any of his medical records. They've all been, were lost in a fire. Um, so what, what, what I will present to you is based on his diary, his letters, and correspondence with uh, his friends. And none of the pictures that I show you relate to Paul Clay himself. But in 1930, um, so a relatively young man, he wrote, there is nothing more hostile than water turning into ice. Never before had I endured such pain in my fingers during such hot weather. So I take that to mean that he had developed Raynaud's phenomenon. And um, let's see, he would have been 21. 50, about 50 years old then. 50-year-old men don't develop primary Raynaud's phenomenon. So this was the harbinger of something else, uh, something more sinister. So uh, Raynaud's phenomenon and digital ulcers, how do we handle them uh, now? Well, the best way to handle Raynaud's phenomenon is cold avoidance and stress management. And um, it's been clearly demonstrated that the best way to increase blood flow in patients with Raynaud's phenomenon is to warm up their hands. So um, non-pharmacologic therapy comes first. In terms of pharmacologic therapy, we have calcium channel blockers, we have topical nitroglycerin, we have phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors if you can get them from the uh, in, uh, insurer. Uh, and we wouldn't necessarily use topical nitrates in sildenafil concurrently. Um, Botox injections in the, in the, around the digital arteries and the sympathetic nerves uh, can be effective, but again, it's difficult to obtain uh, a coverage for that. And for patients with very severe digital sympathectomy, usually with recurrent digital ulcers, um, we will recommend digital sympathectomy only, of course, by a hand surgeon who's really skilled in this technique. Digital ulcers occur in about 15 to 20 percent of scleroderma patients, and they are, account for a significant amount of morbidity. Um, so we treat them with antibiotics if they appear to be infected. We treat them with analgesics because pain itself is a vasoconstrictor. Uh, endothelial and receptor antagonists such as bocentin are not FDA approved for digital ulcers in the United States, but in Europe they are and they may prevent recurrent digital ulcers. And if there's a, a limb uh, threatening, digital threatening ischemia, the best thing to do is to admit that patient to the hospital and uh, treat them with analgesics, antibiotics, and um, in many cases, prostacycline infusions. And the uh, lesson here is to, if you can, avoid surgery. There are times when the pain is intractable or there may be osteomyelitis and surgery is required, but if you will allow, if you not face with that situation and you allow the patient to auto-amputate, uh, 
they'll actually end up with uh, more of a digit than they would if it was surgically amputated. So the most feared vascular complication of scleroderma is scleroderma renal crisis and also scleroderma pulmonary arterial hypertension. So if you're taking your boards and you see that renal arterial lesion there with that onion skin uh, proliferation of the intima, that hyperplasia of the intima, and the slide below is a peripheral smear with a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, that is scleroderma renal crisis. And on the right is the other uh, same, same process, if you will, that the bottom right uh, panel is a pulmonary artery, the same lesion, uh, resulting in severe, uh, in this case, fatal pulmonary arterial hypertension. So scleroderma renal crisis, um, the best way to treat it is to avoid it. So in patients who are newly diagnosed, those with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, especially if they have RNA polymerase 3, we, get, we tell them to get a blood pressure machine. We give them parameters. If their blood pressure normally is 110 over 70, we, and then it goes to 130 over 90, we tell them, call us. Don't call your primary care doctor. They won't be alarmed, but we are alarmed with that sort of change. Uh, have them monitor their blood pressure and contact us if it's elevated. And then if it is, you treat them promptly with an ACE inhibitor as the first line of therapy. One point to emphasize, prophylactic therapy with ACE inhibitors, it, there's no evidence to support it. In fact, you may actually mask scleroderma renal crisis. So try and avoid, if they have hypertension, that's the drug of choice. If not, don't use ACE inhibitors prophylactically. Avoid steroids if possible. And uh, certainly avoid doses of greater than 15 milligrams of prednisone or its equivalent daily because higher doses of steroids can precipitate scleroderma renal crisis. For those patients who do uh, develop renal failure, um, they need to be dialyzed. It's important to realize that dialysis may not be uh, required long term. They may recover renal function up to a year after renal crisis. And for those who don't, then renal transplant is a consideration. Don't make the mistake, uh, one patient I saw recently from North Carolina who developed renal crisis as her presenting manifestation went on to renal failure and was transplanted uh, with, at about six months later. And then she developed uh, renal crisis again in the transplanted kidney. So wait at least a year because number one, there could be some healing and number two, you're less likely to get a recurrence of the disease in the transplanted kidney if you wait a year. Now, what's really interesting, what I've seen in my career, the um, nearly 40 years now, when I started out, um, the, the most feared complication was scleroderma renal crisis. It accounted for 40% of all scleroderma-related deaths. And what happened in the time since then is that it has dropped precipitously, uh, now less than 10%, probably about 6 or 7% of deaths are due to renal crisis. And this is due to the development of captopril as the first ACE inhibitor and subsequent ACE inhibitors. So um, we still see it. It's a, still an emergency, but it's not the problem that it once was. What has happened in the interval is that renal deaths have gone down, but now patients are dying from lung disease. So about 60% of deaths are due to lung disease, either interstitial lung disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension, or sometimes a combination of both. So for scleroderma pulmonary arterial hypertension, you should have a high index of suspicion particularly in patients with limited disease, uh, particularly in those who are anti-centromere antibody positive. And we screen these patients with annual pulmonary function tests and echocardiograms. So we're looking for a, a drop in their diffusion capacity, 
or any changes on the echo that might indicate um, pressure overload on the right ventricle. Now the echo is not, the, is not an ideal screening test, but it's the best we have. Until cardiac MRI becomes uh, more readily available, uh, this is what we're, we're left with. So um, you're looking for um, elevated right-sided pressure, which you can only get if there's a tricuspid regurgitant jet, and about 25% of the time there is no tricuspid regurgitant jet. But you can also look at the uh, right ventricle. Is it hypertrophied? Is the right atrium dilated? There are other clues that there may be pulmonary hypertension. So the echo is useful, but it's not sufficient. So you cannot diagnose pulmonary arterial hypertension without a right heart cath because the definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension is a mean PA pressure of greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury with a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And you don't get that information from an echocardiogram. So many patients will have an elevated estimated right ventricular systolic pressure on echo but it's not PAH, it's pulmonary venous hypertension because they've got a stiff left ventricle, either from age, hypertension, or scleroderm or heart disease. And they're gonna be treated very differently than the patient who has true PAH. So I'm not gonna go through this, this would take a whole hour. We now have three or four different pathways to pharmacologically attack or approach in managing patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. There are over 15 FDA-approved drugs for PAH. There were none when I was a fellow. We use calcium channel blockers, and they really don't work very well. So our job is really not to manage this very complicated part of PAH. Our role as rheumatologists is to diagnose it before it's functional class four, because we know if we diagnose it when it's functional class two or three, they're gonna have a far better outcome. So let's go back to our patient. So the handwriting was on the wall. Um, Clay needed to leave Germany. So he and his wife, Lily, went back to Switzerland. Um, and five years after he wrote about his Raynaud's phenomenon, he became ill. And he was said to have bronchitis with complication of the heart and lungs. And his internists and dermatologists were called in, and for reasons that really escaped me, uh, he was diagnosed as having measles. However, the following year, his wife wrote, because of problems with his skin, blood tests are done for calcium, phosphorus, and metabolic activity. The physicians insist now that it cannot be measles, what is it then? In any case, it is a miracle that he is alive. So at this point, he has cardiac and pulmonary involvement. Uh, this is a picture of him on the top left um, with his wife and his cat, uh, Bimbo. Uh, he's, if you look carefully, he still has a pipe in his hand. His doctor had asked him not to smoke and had asked him not to play the violin, so there's a suggestion that he was having some digital issues as well. But again, no diagnosis at this point. So Clay has gone back to Switzerland where he actually is not very well accepted. Um, he's not a Swiss citizen even though he was born there. Um, the Nazis had a lot of influence in Switzerland. And, and across the border in Germany, uh, prior to World War II, uh, they were, um, the Nazi party was um, trying to change the culture of modern Germany. And one of the things they did, the, the gentleman on the left is Joseph Goebbels, who was the minister of propaganda for uh, Adolf Hitler. And what Goebbels did was to round up art uh, modern art that didn't fit the Nazi ideal. And you've probably seen the films uh, Monuments Men or The Woman in Gold. Uh, what they did is they, they went to museums, they went to private homes, they went to dealers, and they uh, confiscated this art. Uh, 
And in this particular instance, they, uh, Goebbels created an art show of what he called degenerate art. And this contained works of art by Picasso, Chagall, Kandinsky, um, Franz Marc, and there were 17 works by Paul Klee. So this art show opened in Munich. This was the opening. The Führer is there uh, with Goebbels. And then it toured 11 other cities in Germany and Austria and ended up in Berlin where they either sold the art or burned a lot of it, actually. One of the pieces uh, by Paul Clay that was in that uh, show of degenerate art is this uh, really iconic uh, painting named The Twittering Machine, which was sold uh, for $150 and now is worth millions of dollars, of course, and is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So we know from photographs that um, Clay's disease was progressing. On the left is a picture of him in his studio in Bern in 1938. And then two years later, in the same studio, you can see the changes that have occurred in his skin. The skin over his nose is stretched tight. There may be some hyper and hypopigmentation. And I, when I was preparing an article on Clay and his illness, I was struck by this picture on the right, and I um, sort of magnified that left hand. And it suggested to me that he really had either developed um, digital ulcers and had amputation of fingers or a contracture, because he, he certainly is holding his hand very differently than he did just two years earlier in the same studio. So skin disease, well, mild skin disease in patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis may not require any treatment whatsoever. But the patient with diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis, when it, particularly early when it's rapidly progressing, the patient has a lot of uh, pruritus, skin is tender, uh, you might want to use methotrexate unless, of course, they have interstitial lung disease. You might, in some cases, use MMF or even cyclophosphamide. There are no talk on rheumatology is complete without mentioning vitamin R, rituximab. There's some very limited studies suggesting it has a role, but that's unproven. And there's a lot of interest in a new biologic, tocilizumab, which actually was shown to have some benefit on skin and lung function in a small phase two study. And the FDA was impressed enough to get, um, to give it fa fast track status. So there's a larger study ongoing now. And if it's positive, then uh, tocilizumab will be the first biologic to be approved for scleroderma. So we know that Clay had involvement at the GI tract as well. He wrote as he was going to uh, rest at a sanatorium, the diet I imagine is going to do me some good. The difficulty is more one of the mechanism of swallowing. And later, he wrote about lower GI tract involvement. I have qualms about traveling. It is absolute hell for me if I have an episode of diarrhea in the car. It does not happen every day, but I have to anticipate that it might. So many patients have uh, GI involvement from the lips to the anus. So. Um, you have to uh, inquire about it and treat it as best we can. So small meals, anti-reflux precautions, proton pump inhibitors with or without H2 blockers. We don't have a very good prokinetic agent. I don't like metoclopramide, erythromycin might work for some patients. Some patients will um, get domperidone from a Canadian pharmacy. Actually, I think it's probably the best of all of them, but it has some cardiac side effects. And this low FODMAP diet, which I gave you the reference for on the next slide, is not designed for scleroderma, but it helps a lot of my patients. Um, so, um, and you can just print this out for the patient. There's a, if you go to Google Stanford, low FODMAP, it comes up as a PDF, it's a two page diet, what foods are good and what foods to avoid. This helps patients with irritable bowel syndrome. It also helps many patients with scleroderma. Um, 
oral manifestations, he wrote, I have been spending a lot of time at the dentist, and this state of affairs is going to continue, but I am becoming accustomed to it. He is really, he really is very skillful. So patients have dry mouth, they have decreased oral aperture, they may have uh, contractures in their hands, so oral hygiene is a challenge, but it's important that you work with this. And finally, pulmonary involvement. He said, I inhale as deeply as possibly. My dyspnea depends on the trail, whether going up or down. It also depends on the weather, and it also depends on how much food I have in my stomach. I think he just described Raynaud's phenomenon, interstitial lung disease, and gastroesophageal reflux. But he always had a sense of humor. There was a small incline to his house, and this man who used to be an avid hiker in, in Switzerland wrote about that little incline to his flat, this is now my Matterhorn. So we know he had significant uh, pulmonary disease. There are many different causes of pulmonary, of dyspnea in a patient with scleroderma, and this is where it requires your skills as an internist, as well as your collaboration with cardiologists, pulmonologists, radiologists, and gastroenterologists to sort out which cause may be the leading cause. And but keep in mind that patients usually have more than one potential cause, so it really requires a multidisciplinary approach. I just want to uh, tell you about Scleroderma Lung Study 2. This was published uh, several months ago in Lancet Respirology. Um, and this was a uh, double-blind, double randomized controlled trial to compare two years of MMF to one year of cytoxan in patients with scleroderma interstitial lung disease. And the primary outcome was a force vital capacity percent predicted. And, um, you can see that both groups of patients, MMF or cytoxin-treated patients, had a slight improvement in forest vital capacity at two years. And those who improved are above the median there. And I would just point out that in some of these patients, it was 5 to 10 percent, maybe a little bit higher improvement. And we know that the cl mi uh, minimal clinical important difference for patients scleroderma patients is 3%. So, um, and in addition, this study confirmed that cytoxan uh, improved the skin score, and so did MMF. And the important take-home point is that there was no difference between the two um, drugs. So two years of MMF was equivalent to one year of cytoxan. The, the difference is shown in this slide, and that is patients were able to stay on MMF longer than on cytoxan. So it's safer and as effective. So I'm going to just, SLS3 is under construction. Um, so in this study, patients are going to be, all patients are going to get MMF, and half the patients will, in addition, get perfenidone, an antifibrotic drug that is approved for IPF. So um, stay tuned for SLS3. So Clay also had involvement of his hands and joints. He complained about joint pain, and it probably influenced, to some extent, his art. So this is one of his more, more famous works of art. This is called Gefangen, or Captive, um, which he painted in the last year of his life. And you can see the face and the bars, and he felt trapped. He felt like a prisoner in his own body, but also in his own country, uh, where he wasn't uh, uh, accepted as a citizen and where his art was considered to be degenerate by many of the uh, Swiss as well as the Germans. Um, and as an aside, uh, he had applied for Swiss citizenship, and it was denied multiple times, and it was only granted posthumously several weeks after his death. So they didn't really know what he had until 1939. Lilly wrote this. Doctors had finally given us a diagnosis, vasomotor neurosis. And if you go to your medical library and pull out textbooks of medicine from the 20s and 30s, scleroderma is listed under diseases of the blood vessels and the nerves, and it was considered a vasomotor trophic neurosis. So finally, in the last year of his life, 
the diagnosis was confirmed. He knew he was dying. Here's what, one of his last drawings, sick man in a boat. That's uh, considered to be clay lying in the boat being um, charted across the River Styx by Sharon. How was he treated? Well, he got uh, theobromine and didge. He got some heavy metals and liver extract, vitamin C, and uh, thyroid extract as well. He entered a sanatorium in, 19, in May of 1940. His wife wrote, his condition was fair for the first two weeks, but then he suddenly became very ill. He was fighting for his life, and he died in June of 1940. The cause of death was heart disease. This is one of his last paintings, um, Death and Fire. T-O-D, Todd is a German word for death. You can see the white death mask and the words, the letters T-O-D. So in terms of managing the disease now, we have drugs that treat the vascular component. We have drugs that may treat some of the autoimmune issues. The real um, change that's going to come in the next 10 years or so will be drugs that are antifibrotic. And um, Big Pharma is very interested in this, um, not because scleroderma is so important to them, but in the developed world, 45% of all deaths are due to fibrosis, cardiac, lung, liver. Uh, so it's a big field for them, and they're putting a lot of money into developing antifibrotic drugs. I'm just going to close with one slide because your patients are going to ask you about stem cell therapy. And these are the results of the Scott study, the large study done in the United States that were, was presented at the ACR and will be published in the next few months, I'm sure, and where patients were randomly assigned to get uh, hem hematopoietic stem cell therapy or monthly IV cytoxan for a year. And the um, curves there show that the patients who got stem cell transplant uh, had a, a better event-free survival. That is, they didn't develop new organ involvement as frequently as did those who got cytoxan, and they had a better overall survival with a five-year follow-up. So it's still an experimental protocol, very expensive, very difficult to be uh, covered by an insurance company. Um, but I used to discourage my patients from this therapy because the treatment-related mortality in the European studies was about 10%. But in the Scott study, the treatment-related mortality was 3%. So in some patients, there may be an acceptable risk. So uh, again, it's still experimental. We need safer uh, forms of stem cell transplantation, and people are certainly working on that. So I would just conclude by uh, with the, that the current classification criteria has greater sensitivity and specificity. The three facets of this disease are fibrosis, vascular disease, and autoimmunity. And treatment has to be directed towards each of these different facets. And as we get, begin to understand better the molecular events underlying fibrosis, we will certainly develop more effective antifibrotic drugs. And finally, by presenting this case of Paul Clay, um, it lends a more human aspect to this disease. And I think even though this can be a frustrating disease, it can also be rewarding uh, to manage these patients over time. And if you, I would encourage those of you who are going into practice to get to know the scleroderma specialist at the closest scleroderma center because they're eager to help you uh, co-manage these patients. Thank you for your attention.